Go ahead. Good afternoon. This is Deb Collins. Excuse me from Casa Myrna. Thank you, Deb. Hello. This is Aurelia from a safe place in Tucket. Thank you. Hey, everyone. This is Becca Bradbird from Elizabeth Freeman Center. Hi, Becca. Hi everyone, this is Matt Swoblin from The Second Step. Hi Matt. Anyone else? Shaquilla from Center for Hope and Healing, welcome. Is that everybody? Except for, I'm sorry, my centers. Okay, so um, just a few logistics before we start. I'm going to mute you all first. And um, just a few logistics. Um, first, if anyone experienced any technical assistance, uh, any technical difficulties, whether via audio or your video, there is a technical assistance line uh, through Zoom, and the phone number is 1-888-799-9666. Again, 1-888-799-9666. You press 2, and you will just give the code of uh, the conference call today, and they will provide you with, with any assistance. Again, uh, everyone who comes in, they are muted. There's going to be times where I'm going to be unmuting everyone, just because, uh, again, we're trying to make this a little bit more interactive, because it's not a webinar. It's a web call, technical assistance call. So I want to encourage everyone to be a little bit more participatory um, during the call. And so um, if you see that I unmute you and um, you want to mute yourselves, please do so. There is also on the bottom of your screen or the top, there's a chat uh, option. If you do not want or don't feel comfortable addressing whatever your questions are, please write them in the chat room and um, Maureen and I will call those questions out to uh, Lumaire. During your presentations, you can also ask questions as well via the chat or um, there's a uh, an option of raising your hand as well on the web call. So you can raise your hand and I'll make sure that I, um, I call you and I'll address that question with Lumaire as well. We are, as I said, we're gonna start recording your, the web call. So if you don't feel comfortable with your faces being recorded, please um, just check that off on the bottom of your screen. Okay, so um, without further ado, do you have any uh, no, I do want to welcome Olga from Center for Hope and Healing, um, who's joined, and that's all. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, Lumaya, I'm going to unmute you so um, you can begin and introduce yourself, please. Okay. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for having us. Uh, excited to be able to join you all on this call. So I'm actually on the call. My name is Lumaya Orozco. And I'm a project manager here at Casa de Esperanza. And I'm also on the call today with um, Juan Jose Lara, who was a colleague of mine. And Juan Jose and I have been working together over the past year or so on providing language access training and technical assistance to a lot of the, um, to a lot of the state coalitions. Um, and so, and I have to go back because it's Jose Wang. I always get it wrong. I always call him Juan Jose, but it's Jose Wang. So when you heard that little swoosh, that was him correcting me. I apologize, JJ. Um, so anywho, um, we are from Casa de Esperanza. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with who we are, we are the National Latino Resource Center on Domestic Violence in Latino Communities. Um, and we became a resource center in 2011. 
um, by way of um, our grant that we received from FIPSA and HHS. And we're also uh, training a culturally specific training and TA provider for OVW. We have, um, oh my gosh, maybe five to seven grants with OVW that we oversee and provide culturally specific training and TA on. So um, that's a lot of the work that we do. So at Casa Esperanza, we have a national project called the National Latino Network for Healthy Families and Communities. I would encourage you all um, to check out that website. Um, tons of great information. Um, we have an LEP toolkit on there. We also have a link to a LEP toolkit uh, for the courts toolkit. Um, we have some evidence-based toolkits that we utilize um, in terms of helping um, folks document the work that you're currently doing. So I would certainly encourage you to check that out. It's the nationallatinonetwork.org. Um, it's the national arm of all of the work that we do at Casa de Esperanza. And under that arm of the work, um, what we have here, in addition to the training and technical assistance that we provide, uh, which is the arm that um, Jose Juan and I are representing here today as a training and technical assistance team. We also have a research center that's based out of Austin, Texas. Um, we conduct research on Latino communities and domestic violence and uh, a lot of research at the intersections of, of Latino communities and the, the multitude of different experiences that, that we have in, in all of our identities. We also have a policy department, a, pro, a department that's headed up by Olga Trujillo, or as a director of policy. And so in that work, we're very um, prominent, we're very um, visible in DC in terms of ensuring that the policy work that's being done at a national level not only um, includes the voices of Latino communities, but that strategies and policies that are being developed are indeed addressing the needs of the Latino community as well. And so you can learn a little bit more about um, who we are on that website. I just wanted to give you a, a quick little snapshot. Um, so that's a little bit about who we are um, and the purpose of our call today. Um, so I've been doing some work with Deanna and with Maureen a couple of months ago back in uh, earlier this year around language access. Um, we've been tasked by FIPSA um, to work with state coalitions on helping to support their member programs on ensuring that member programs are able to comply with the federal uh, regulations um, as it pertains or the federal requirements as it pertains to providing language access to um, domestic violence sexual, and sexual assault victims um, with limited English proficiency. And so part of what we want to be able to do today is to be able to answer any of the questions that you might have um, we did provide Deanna um, with some links for um, some pre-recorded webinars, um, some webinars that we uh, conducted earlier um, this year for the Virginia Coalition, and, and they were more than, than happy to um, allow us to share those with coalitions who might be able to benefit from those. So if you had an opportunity to actually view those webinars, um, you would have seen two different webinars. The first webinar um, talked about the ethical requirements and the legal requirements for providing language access, the, 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 the reasons why we must do it legally, right? Um, so um, Andrea Caballos, who was our policy director at that time, took you through that, through that process of really helping to inform you on, on the why, on the legal requirements. Um, we also talk a lot about, you know, that language access is also, um, there's also a moral requirement to that that it's really about um, us doing the right thing. So, you know, even though we're required by these uh, federal regulations or these um, to be able to, to have to put in place language access plans and, and, and institutionalize those within our organizations, we also do have this moral requirement to do the right thing. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we're all in, in, in this field and the purpose of our work is to ensure the safety of victims and their families. And by being able to, to provide language access, we're able to, to get one step closer to ensuring that victims with limited English proficiency are able to access all of our services um, across, you know, across the many different spectrums of services that we provide. So um, with that, um, that was one of the webinars. The second webinar is a webinar that actually um, took you through some steps to consider when developing your language access plan. 
and it was pre pretty thorough um, in nature, but you know, I, I also know that it does bring up a lot of different questions for folks as, as you're viewing it, right? Because we're not quite sure exactly, you know, what it means, for example, to provide a meaningful access or what are some meaningful steps and what, is, what do those look like if you're an organization that has, you know, a, a large pool of funding um, discretionary funding that you might be able to pull from versus a small um, community-based organization who might have very limited funding. What does that look for each one of these organizations when you're trying to identify what are those meaningful steps that we all need to take in order to ensure um, language access? And then finally, and I'm not sure if Diana had a chance to share this with you, but we also have um, an LEP toolkit that's available online. It's available through our National Latino Network website, and it's very comprehensive in nature. Um, we created this toolkit maybe about a year and a half ago, and what we did prior to creating the toolkit is that we had we conducted a, we conducted a survey, national survey with Latina advocates, um, to kind of figure out what would be of most help to advocates when providing language access. Um, and so what we heard from advocates was simply walk us through this process step by step that we need to undertake to ensure that we're able to, to create a language access plan that works for our organizations. So I would highly encourage you, if you haven't had a chance yet to look at the LEP toolkit, I'd highly encourage you to check it out. Um, it's very comprehensive in nature in, in, in the in the event that you're starting from scratch, in the event that your organization doesn't have a language access plan, um, it gives you all the things that need to be considered before embarking on that journey, and it walks you step by step um, through that entire process. And it also gives you um, some feedback and some guidance in the event that you already have a language access plan in place, but you might be looking to enhance it or to revisit it, right? Because one of the things that we want to be able to do on a yearly basis is to revisit our language access plan to ensure that it's doing what it was meant to do that it that we're actually providing language access that you know um, that we um, that it guides us and making any modifications we need to make it you know in the event that a community that you might be working with um, has recently emerged or has been a growing community that um, all of sudden is one that you're seeing more and more participants from those kind of situations so um, so in order to start, what I'd like to go ahead and do is first ask, you know, those on the line, if you all had an opportunity to actually um, view those two webinars um, that I referenced earlier here. And you can just say yes, or you can just type it up on the chat line or in the chat box. I just want to get a feel to ensure that at least some of you had an opportunity. Okay, so Matt hasn't had a chance yet. Okay. I'm going to unmute because um, uh, some of them are joining us via phone. So I want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to say um, address whatever they need to. Certainly. Okay. Definitely. Okay. You are all unmuted. Okay. So, so far we've had a couple who haven't had a chance yet. Okay. And Shaquille had a chance to be the, one, the first one so far. Okay. So, so I would highly encourage you all then to, when you get a moment, to really take it the time, and I know it's a little time consuming, each webinar is about an hour and a half long, but um, I, I would encourage you to, to really take a look at those webinars. Um, they will, um, for sure, answer a lot of the questions that you might have, um, and it's a resource that you can refer to again and again. Once you have access to those webinars, you're able to go back to them um, as, as much as you need to, okay? So, I mean, I, we can go ahead and um, take some questions and see what folks, um, what are some of those lingering questions that you might have around language access? What are some of the concerns that you have? Um, what do you see as some of the challenges? And then figuring out how, you know, uh, how Jane Doe um, and us here at CASA can help support you all in this process to ensure that you're able to develop a plan. Um, that's meaningful, um, and that'll get you where you need to be in terms of providing language access. And I just want to say that, you know, all questions are good questions, so please um, ask, you know, if it comes to mind, just shoot it, put it out there, and, and let us um, figure out how we can help you. Um, in the event that there's a question that I may not know the answer to, I'm going to be completely transparent and let you know that. Uh, but one thing that we are going to be doing is, um, Jose Juan is compiling um, all of the questions that come up 
So we will be putting together um, we will be putting together a a frequently asked question document uh, where we'll uh, address each one of those questions in writing so that you also have access to that information as well. And we'll continue to build on it as we're going to continue to do this these calls with several coalitions. So as those questions come up. Um, and we revise that document, we'll be sure to send it to Deanna and she can share that with you so that you have that. Thank you. Sure. Good. I, I just want to say too that I know that folks on the line are probably, or on the call, are maybe all in different places and you may have um, strategies that you're already doing but you may not have a plan written down. So this is a good way to sort of talk through some of that. Um, Right. And we do have a question um, about language line and primary language services for sexual assault and domestic violence. So I think maybe that's a good a starting off kind of question to um, would love to hear about um, Casa Desperanza's um, perceptions around language line. I would say that a lot of um, that SafeLink, which is the statewide hotline, um, uses links to language line when they have folks that they can't meet the language access needs on the hotline. Um, okay. But I'm not sure if that's what everybody's doing across the state. Um, and it may be. And I, and I think that we talked about in previous conversations the, the pros and cons of language line. So I think that would be, would be a good thing to talk about. Definitely. So I think um, to address Shaquille's question, um, only the first one, okay, is language line the primary language services used for SA and DV, um, unfortunately, language line, well, the telephonic interpretation line is um, Pacific in particular, is the largest uh, language line um, interpreter services provider. Um, and so a lot of organizations um, defer to language line as their primary um, step when provided language access. Right, so um, in many states, and it might work different um, in, in your state in terms of how organizations are able to access language line. So language line is um, a, a first good step um, in your language access plan. It shouldn't be your only step. It's, however, it is a very reasonable step, right? So for example, um, in the state of Minnesota, we have uh, a service, a statewide service, um, by which it's called day one. And what day one does is ensure, they keep track of all the open beds and all the shelters across the, the state. And so um, as an organization um, in, in Minnesota, Casa Espinosa has a direct services program in, in St. Paul, Minnesota, we're able to access language line through that day one service. So basically, that the way that it's worked for us is that we don't have a direct contract with Language Line because oftentimes that can be pretty spending um, and expensive for an organization. So what we've been able to do is we've been able to piggyback off um, Day One's contract with the Language Line, where um, we've contracted with with them and in order to utilize that service as we needed in order to provide language access services within the organization. And so um, the way that that works for us is that we've been able to contract with uh, Language Line. Um, we utilize their 1-800 number. We utilize their, their code to be able to access Language Line. And what um, Day One does in return is they then bill us for any time that we use on that Language Line. So the way that that process works is once that we're able to engage with Language Line, um, our advocates um, do, at the end of that call fill out a document, a, a form that indicates the date of the call, the, the uh, operator number who was spoken to, the reason for the call, and that that information is then faxed over to day one. And then day one, when they do their billing cycle, then bills us for that, for that service. Something that we've been been able to do so the primary reason for, for being able to contract with day one is that for us as a culturally specific latino organization in minneapolis st paul the primary um community that we work with are latinos but there are times where you also have a, a very large um resettlement community a refugee community the Hmong community um and the Hmong community are, are we've we've had victims in shelter that we've provided services to and unfortunately, none of our advocates speak mom. 
So what we've been able to do is two things that we've been able to do. One is being able to utilize the language line to be, be able to communicate with that victim, um, to do the intake, um, to be able to have that day-to-day -day, um, interaction with her while she's in shelter to ensure that she's doing well. Uh, so, so we use the language line in that way as well, but also we've had an opportunity to do some advocacy where we have um, co-advocacy agreements in place with culturally, other culturally specific community-based organizations that provide DV services in, in the St. Paul and Minneapolis area. And what that allows us to do is to work in partnership with another culturally specific DV organization so that we are working hand in hand with uh, an advocate from that organization to ensure that the victim that we're providing shelter uh, services services to a shelter is not only having her language access needs met by the language line, but also her cultural uh, needs met as well by being able to connect her directly with a an advocate from her community who understands her her traditions and her culture and her beliefs and all that good stuff. So in a situation, language line is a, it's a telephonic interpretation line that's utilized by multiple, multiple fields um, and, and not only limited to domestic violence and sexual assault. The language line is well utilized by lawyers, is utilized in courts, it's utilized by hospitals, is utilized by corporate America. Um, the only caution um, that I would give with language line is that a lot of the interpreters on the line don't necessarily have domestic or essay background, right? And so they might not have the necessary terminology to be able to communicate effectively um, with the victim that you might have, that you might be wanting some interpretation services for. Um, you want to be able to keep um, an eye out on what that interaction looks like. Um, if you're an advocate, for example, that, that might be kind of a language line to, to get access for a victim who speaks Spanish and you happen to know a little bit about Spanish or a little Spanish, that you can tell that something's not going right. Uh, it, you know, because it happens a lot. It happens a lot just in terms of terminology. Even within the Latino community, you have so many different dialects of Spanish. You know, I'm from Puerto Rico, and there are words that I say that are completely offensive to, to, to the Mexican community. Um, and there are words from other communities that I just don't know what they mean. So when we think about an, an interpreter on the phone who does not only understand the cultures that we're working with, but also doesn't have, who do, they also don't have that terminology in terms of DV and SA. Um, that's where it can get a little bit challenging. Um, but it is, um, it is a good resource to have. It is a good resource to have because it's a quick fix, right? You're able to access services, language access services for a victim within minutes. Um, another thing to consider, in addition to using the language line, is, you know, um, would be the use of in-person interpreters. Um, that is certainly an intensive process to undertake because you can't simply um, pick up the phone and call an interpreter interpretation service. You want to ensure that anybody that you're working with is someone that you've already vetted that it's an organization that you've had extensive conversations around about what types of languages they provide services for. You know, how soon are they able, for example, to get you an interpreter who speaks Spanish or Russian? How long would it take to, to get an interpreter, for example, for a language of lesser diffusion, um, Farsi or, um, some other language that might not be commonly spoken in the area. Um, you wanna have conversations around what type of trainings, training do your interpreters um, get on a yearly basis, right? Because if I'm a DB service provider or an SA service provider, I want to ensure that the interpreter that's coming to provide services in person for, for the victim that I'm working with has some background around domestic violence and sexual assault. So you'll want to spend some time ensuring that you're able to provide services, that you're able to offer training services to that 
um, interpretation service organization around DVN essay. That's critical. Um, being able to provide training to that organization around a trauma informed approach. Um, having some conversations around, you know, helping interpreters um, do some self care. Because something that we've run into quite a bit is when we engage with interpreters who don't have the background around domestic violence or sexual assault, that we're also causing them trauma, right? And we're causing them some harm when we put them in situations where, where details around sexual assaults are very explicit and very challenging to deal with, especially if an interpreter isn't prepared to hear some of those things. But certainly the language line, although it does, you know, it does have its faults, it's not perfect. It's certainly, if you're able to do that, if you're able to, to contract with the language line, if you're able to figure out a way to, let's say, for example, that the, your, your organization, organization doesn't have the funds available to be able to contract directly with the language line, because it could be pretty expensive. You know, how do you partner up with other organizations who might have access with the language line? Could you have conversations with those other organizations around their willingness to be able to contract with you on a as needed basis, where you might be able to, when you might be able to have access to their language line and they'd be willing to bill you for the language line? Can you please mute yourselves for those who are not speaking at the moment? I will mute you. <laughs> okay, can you still hear me? Yes, I can still hear you. Okay, so was that helpful? Does that answer your question? Yes, I, and I was actually going to... Um, kind of like just going back to the meaningful access that um, when we were going through this process and we're still in the process of, um, you know, working on our language access plan. And as you were mentioning, uh, language, the uh, language line uh, or the interpreted line is not the only uh, option or the only way to really think about that meaningful access. And for, at least for me, when I was working through this language access plan, that was one of the things that I keep thinking about, like what does the meaningful access mean? So I was hoping you could talk a little bit about like what does that, what does that really mean? And does it mean different for, for, for you than it means to me or it means to um, one of our member programs, Casamirna or um, Second Step, but like what does that mean for, for each of the programs? Definitely. Okay, so meaningful access basically means what are you as an organization able to do within your, your reality, within your budget, within your capacity to provide language access? And that looks different for everybody. There is not one, there, there's not one plan that works for all organizations. You really have to be mindful about thinking about, like Diana was saying, is what's going to work for you. So meaningful access for a small, for Casa Mirna, for example, I'm not very familiar with Casa Mirna, but if Casa Mirna is a small organization, contracting with Language Line is probably not feasible. Right, because you might not have the money set aside, you might not have the monies available to be able to do that. Right, so then what we look at is, you know, are there staff internally who might be able to provide those interpretation services? Do you have staff that might speak that language? Right, uh, now, having said that, it's not a preference to have staff serve as an interpreter, right, because for example, if you're using an advocate as an interpreter, there's a conflict of interest, right? You need an interpreter who is um, not biased and who is neutral in the situation, who is simply there to communicate word for word what the victim is saying and then interpreting that into the, to the English language. So that's understood by everyone else. Where you run into an issue with an advocate being an interpreter is that the advocate finds themselves in a situation where they have to take off their advocate hat and put on the interpreter hat, 
right? Where oftentimes as an advocate, you have a lot more information available to you because the victim has shared a lot more with you than what they might be sharing at the moment of interpretation, right? And so the advocate needs to be able to, to discern which hat they have on. Uh, once you're interpreting, your sole job as an interpreter is to translate the language. Translate what the victim is saying, interpret that into the English language without adding any additional information, right? Not what you know, not what she's shared with you, not what your thoughts are about what she should be doing in the situation. You're simply interpreting word for word exactly what the victim is saying for you. Now, having said that, the reality for many um, community-based programs is that we need to use, you know, staff members as interpreters. So if that's one of, of the ways that you're, you're hoping to be able to provide language access, what I would encourage you to do is find ways to, to be able to train advocates to ensure that when they're providing interpreter services, they're doing just that. And that there's clear communication between the advocate and the victim as to what those different roles are, right? This is certainly great to be able to do, you know, if you need to use a staff member within your organization as an interpreter, you know, figure out internally what that might look like for you. What are, um, what's gonna, what are the principles that are going to guide what that, what that looks like? Um, outside of the organization in terms of going to a court hearing or a OFP order for protection hearing, um, you do not want your advocate serving as an interpreter, right? The courts themselves have the responsibility to provide language access. Um, if you find yourself in that situation when you're in court with a victim who, of a, who is limited English proficient and the court is not providing language access, uh, you certainly have um, avenues to ensure that that work does happen. Most courts have a, a, either a language access coordinator. It's either at the, at the court county level. Some states have it at the state level. I found out last week that some courts have a language access coordinator at a Supreme Court level within the state. So you'll need to figure out what kind of where the language access coordinator is housed for the state of Massachusetts. I'm not sure where that is. Some courts have a court interpreter's office. So you want to make sure that you reach out to them in the event that, that um, the court is not providing language access. And finally, judges have access to the language line. Right? It's not their preference, but um, they have access to the language line. So they should, at, at the very least, provide that um, access in a court hearing. It's never an advocate's responsibility to bring an interpreter or to find an interpreter. It's the court's responsibility to provide that service. And if you go to our website, I had mentioned earlier that we have an LAP toolkit for the courts. There is some really good guidance on what you would be able to do um, and handle a situation where you find yourself in the court that doesn't provide language access. So, um, I didn't I also wanted to ask um, the participants on the call if they have any particular concerns of um, implementing the language access plan and like what are their concerns based on what you have said, uh, based on what they're already doing, but now that they're, um, well, they've always, if they receive federal funding, they've always been required to do it. And as you were mentioning, there's that moral, moral requirement as well. But I'm wondering if, like, you have any concerns, those who are on the call? Because I know I had concerns. So I'm wondering if you had any concerns and if we could, if you feel comfortable addressing those concerns. So um, Lumaida can help us out to, um, to address those concerns. So I'm going to unmute. Can I say something really quick before we go there is that in terms of providing language access, so language access is required, a federal requirement. And, and something that we hear a lot from organizations, big and small, is that we don't have the money. The way the federal government sees it is that we gave you the money, right? So you received funding for the federal government, so they gave us money. Um, 
to do this work. So what we need to think about is how do we make some budget allocations to ensure that we're able to provide meaningful language access? Right, so you need to look at your budget and say, where can we shift some monies around to ensure that we have $500, right? $1,000 set aside to ensure that we're able to cover a bill from the language line or that to ensure that we're able to cover paying a fee to a, a in-person interpreter. Um, because at the end of the day, the way the federal government sees it is that they've given you the money, so you have the money. There is no reason to say that we don't have the funding. Um, it's just a matter of how we look at it, how we allocate those monies. Um, and, and like Deanna says, at the end of the day, it's the right thing to do for many different reasons. Above and beyond the federal requirements, we have to think about it's a safety issue and it's a, a well-being issue for the victims that, that, that we provide services to. You know, we also need to be able to, to think about, you know, um, at the end of the day, if something happens, let's say a victim reaches out for services and we're not able to provide language access for whatever reason. You know, we don't have access to the language line or we don't have a staff who speaks that language or, or, or a myriad of other reasons. If something happens to that victim, right, as a result of us not providing language access, we run the risk of a complaint being filed. And there are some very savvy advocates out there who know, who know the law and who know, you know what a victim's rights are as it pertains to language access. We've seen situations in several states where victims have been turned away from services because of their limited English proficiency. Um, we've had folks reach out to us to let to us CASA letting us know of those situations. And, and there's, there's um, pathways to filing complaints, right? So there is uh, a way that you can file a complaint um, online um, directly to the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice um, takes these very seriously. Um, they, they investigate these cases. Um, there might be sanctions that are put upon a program who doesn't meet the federal requirements of providing language access. Um, and, and you run the risk of, of that complaint um, ultimately negatively impacting your funding, right? So DOJ can very well come and say, you know, you failed here, here, and here. Um, we may not want to provide any additional funding you know, going forward. So not only is this about you know, doing the right thing, um, but the, le the legal requirements are there for a reason, right? And we wanna ensure that, you know, again, um, we're able to comply with those to the best of our ability. So to that, I just wanted to say that, you know, um, I think at the end of one of the PowerPoints, I think of the second PowerPoint on how to develop a language access plan, my contact information is there. So as you're working through your plan, you know, you can reach out to Deanna, you can reach out to me. If you reach out to me, know that I'm gonna reach out to Deanna so that Deanna is aware of kind of the challenges that are coming up or the questions that you're all having so that her and I can work together to support you in this process. What we really wanna be able to do is ensure that you're able to put in a plan in place that's meaningful, that works for you as an as a individual organization, but that also, um, that also is one that's gonna provide the best language access that you can to the victims that you currently serve and those who may not be coming to you yet, who might come to you in the future. So I'll leave it with that so you can go ahead and open it up. Okay, so again, my my question was if you, thank you to Maire for addressing that, um, but my question was also, what are your concerns um, while you're thinking about implementing this, um, aside from being required to do so, what are your concerns around developing this? And I know that we all have concerns because, uh, again, uh, Maureen and I went through this and are still going through this, and we had concerns from the very beginning, and we still do. So I want you to feel completely comfortable and knowing that you will not be judged um, or, um, you know, feel comfortable to address those things because we are 
And I'm glad that you are trying to think about those things while, um, while you're developing the, your language access plan, because that at least tells me that you're thinking about it. So please, I'm going to unmute you, and if there's any concerns that you have around this, or questions that you may want to address with uh, Lumaidi or us, Jane Doe, please do so. Okay, you are unmuted now. Hi, this is Matt from The Second Step. Um, I think the main, one of the main questions that comes up for me is, um, if you have a situation where you know, we have um, an advocate who is using language line or, or something to one of those resources to translate for um, a client where they've got apps where the advocate has absolutely no knowledge of the of the other language so it's not something where they might know a little bit of of the language and be able to understand how what sorts of other resources are available to them or how how should we talk to our advocates about how best to make sure that you know as best possible um, that nothing additional is being added or that the conversation is kind of happening in an appropriate way for the client or the, the especially if it's around a very challenging, subtle situation. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I'm imagining an advocate sort of sitting there in, in kind of silence, not having any idea what the exchange looks like and how, how to sort of prepare advocates for, for that eventuality. Certainly, yeah, I think that's a great question, Matt. So here's what I would say, a couple of things. First, you know, encourage advocates to trust their gut instinct, right? So even if you don't understand the language that's being spoken, just by the body language of the victim, right? Um, keeping a really, um, being very aware of how the victim is interacting on the call, of um, maybe any hesitation, anything like that. Um, the one recourse that you do have on the language line is this, is that if for whatever reason at any point the advocate feels that the call is not going well, that the interpreter may not be communicating what she needs to have communicated. Um, that, for example, if um, the victim is um, in, in the midst of speaking, she has spoken for about a minute, and the interpreter comes back with a, a, a question that, uh, an, or an answer that's five seconds long, you know something's not happening there. So your advocate has the recourse on the language line to say, you know, we'd like to end this call and we would like an another um, interpreter on the phone. Okay. What I would encourage you to do, Matt, is keep an Excel spreadsheet, it's easiest, or you can use whatever mechanism you want, to always ensure that when your your advocates use the language line, you're able to document those types of situations. And what you want to capture is, you know, the date of the call, possibly the time of the call, and the operator ID number. Mm -hmm. Every interpreter on the language line has an operator ID number, so you want to be able to document that. And then maybe a really short narrative is describing what happened. And that you have that document accessible to all of your advocates and all of your staff who use the language line. So in the event in the future that somebody calls and ends up with that same operator, they can say, no thanks, but I'd rather have another operator. Okay. But what you want to do is you want to just prepare your advocates to, to follow their gut. You know, advocates, you know when the situation is right. not right, right? And trust them to go with that. There is no repercussions at all for you asking for a new interpreter, um, you know, and, and you can keep repeating that process until the advocate feels that you've found someone who actually uh, was communicating well with the victim. Okay. 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 Thanks. Sure, welcome. Anyone else, any other questions? No need to be shy. I have a question for everybody, actually. So, um, and see if you can you can either respond on the chat or um, on the phone. So, what are you currently doing, and um, what are the things that you're you know as you're thinking about developing this plan? I mean, I feel like a lot of us are already doing something regardless of having it in a written format or not, we are already doing something. 
because that's part of the advocacy that we all are doing with our communities. So um, if you could share with us, if you feel comfortable sharing, what is that you are doing right now uh, to make that uh, accessive your, uh, accessible your services to your communities? Right, and I would just add to that, the only thing that I would add is exactly what Deanna just said, is that all you're doing with your access plan is you're formalizing your practice. Correct. A lot of you are already providing language access in very creative ways. Right? So it's just a matter of documenting it in a, in a document so that we're able to utilize that plan to train your staff so that in, in the event that a situation occurs, that you need to refer to it, you have a handy to say, you know, we have it formally written down. And, and, and that's certainly the truth that you're already doing language access. It's a matter about formalizing it in writing. Okay, so I'm going to unmute again and um, want to be mindful also of time. So uh, you can be as brief or um, as possible with, okay, so we have one, someone responding. To yeah, um, we have a question that came in, which is a great question. Can your volunteer do interpretation without having an interpreter certification? Oh, wow. It, it depends, right? So, um, certified interpreters are difficult to find in, in the most commonly spoken languages. Well, let's put that up. If you're talking about a language of lesser diffusion, a language that you are going to run into finding challenges in identifying an interpreter within the state or, you know, within a reasonable distance from where you're at, um, I want to say, yes, you can use an interpreter that is not certified. What I would encourage you to do is to look into um, Asian Women United in San Francisco. I believe, if it, if, and I'll look it up and I'll, and I'll share the correct research. I'm sure it's Asian Women United in San Francisco. They have a program. It's a language broker program. And so what they've done is they have recruited community members from their community and have trained them on DV and SA, and also on uh, how to provide interpreter services, right? That way, these um, community members are seen as interpreters. They're not certified interpreters, but they're seen as reliable um, interpreters who have been trained in DV and SA, um, who have received training on how to be an interpreter, um, and who are also compensated by the um, um, community-based organizations that utilize their services. In some communities, um, for example, um, in St. Paul, the Hmong and the Somali community are very small, right? And so you're gonna run into the issue sometimes of the difficulties identifying an interpreter from those communities that the victim doesn't know who doesn't know the victim or who doesn't know the the abuser or who who is not you know related or or knowledgeable of, of that family um so you know in those situations we have also seen community members being brought in as interpreters again they've been trained on DVNSA they've been trained as interpreters with special attention being um, provided to training on confidentiality and what that looks like. Um, the preference is always to be able to, to identify uh, a certified interpreter, but we also know that with a lot of the, the um, languages of less, lesser diffusion, there are certifications available for those languages. So sometimes we have to make do with what we have access to and sometimes that is, you know, um, interpreters that haven't been certified. It's just a matter of figuring out, you know, what types of capacity building do you need to do as an organization to ensure that that interpreter is well versed in DVNSA, 
uh, and also has a, a, a critical understanding of their responsibility as, inter as an interpreter and the responsibility to maintain that confidentiality. Marie, just to follow up on that, I, I know we had some materials from the training in Dallas around sort of identifying, you know, quali not necessarily certified, but what are the kinds of questions you want to be asking as an organization to ensure that the person who's doing the interpretation has the correct qualifications? Is that in the toolkit? That is not in the toolkit, but what I can do and what we can do is reach out to API. Okay. Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence, they are um, a TA provider under ITARC, and ITARC is specifically uh, focuses on interpretation and translation services, so they do a lot of training on uh, working with interpreters. So we can certainly um, reach out to them and have them provide a webinar for you all okay. on how to vet interpreters, what you need to look for, how to work with them directly, um, and that's a, that's a training that they do, so we can certainly reach out to API, um, and I can connect you all so that you can um, go ahead and set that up with them so that you can make it available to your member programs. Thanks. Because that's certainly a critical piece to have is understanding how to work with the interpreters, both on the phone and in person. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure. So again, I just want to be mindful of time. Sorry, I'm like the timekeeper here. <laughs> um, and so I want to thank uh, Lumari. Am I pronouncing your name right, Lumari? Lumari. Lumari. Okay, Lumari. Lumari in English. Lumari in Spanish. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, thank you so much. Thank you to Casa Esperanza. Thank you to um, everyone who participated. Uh, for me, at least, I can speak for myself that for me, this whole like language access plan has been uh, a huge like um, experiential learning. Um, so I really want to encourage you to reach out to us, to Maureen and I, while you're going through the process. Um, and so we can walk you through the same. I'm pretty sure we're going to go through the same things that you may be going through. So please don't don't um, feel free to reach out to us through this process. And again, if you have any questions, you can send them to me, and I'll make sure that um, I uh, reach out to Casa de Esperanza if there's anything else that we didn't address here. I highly encourage everyone to watch the webinars; they're super helpful. So they pretty much answer a lot of our questions. So or any questions that you may have. Um, and I want to just really quick, I'm going to be sending a short evaluation to everybody um, who attended the call today. Again, we really appreciate your feedback and it just helped us to better understand your needs and if there's, if we did a good job, which I'm sure we did, but uh, in case, uh, if there's anything that we didn't address, we really um, encourage and appreciate your feedback. So if there's anything that you want to address really quick. Just really quickly, I would say one of the things that's been sticking in my head is the, the part of the language access plan that I, I see as partially aspirational too, um, and that it's a way for you all to build in, it's a plan, right? So here's what we're doing now, here's what we're aspiring and striving to do. And, you know, and build in things like how much you're gonna pay staff who are doing this ad. Like there's a way that, Folks who are involved in this can help hold your organization accountable for moving forward and continuing this. It, it is a process, as uh, Lumerie said, around people, you know, emerging uh, populations coming into your community. And so it's, it's really an opportunity for folks who may have been trying to get this done at your organization for a long time to, um, to really get this documented and on paper and, and have ongoing dialogue with your coworkers and your, um, your whole staff. So it's a great exercise, it's very important. Are there any closing um, things that you may want to address, Lumari? No, I just, again, just thank you, again, just for the opportunity to, to be present and to share with you all today. And like I mentioned, you know, um, any questions that you all might have, certainly reach out to Diana. Like she says, she will reach out to me um, if she needs to. Um, I, again, encourage you to check out the webinars. Certainly take a look at the, the LAP toolkits. Um, Diana, did I send you the link to the LAP toolkit? 
Uh, we actually already put it on the uh, procurement uh, resources, so everybody who has access to it will be able to see them as well. Perfect. So I would certainly encourage you to look at that because that will literally take you step by step. You know, it's something that you would break down into very, I, it sounds overwhelming, and it is overwhelming because I remember when I undertook Casa's language access plan about three years ago, oh my gosh, like, I thought I could do it by myself, but it turned out you need a group, a work group of folks to work with you on, right? And so what we did is we took one step at a time. We started like with one, what's our purpose? And I think it took us a couple of weeks to identify our purpose and a couple more weeks to identify who were the community members that we were working with. You know, so certainly take your time. Um, and again, but the toolkit is very helpful in taking you step by step and giving you some ideas of the things that you need to think about. And again, just look at it as, you know, it's, it's a benefit. It's a benefit for all of us, right? For victims and their families, but also it, it's a benefit to us because we also learn in this process the importance of being able to provide language access and, and what that means to our organizations and the communities that we work with. So again, I thank you. Um, and I just want to wish you all a happy holidays. Thank, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. You, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.